Um, so I thought I would start by telling you how I got interested in water waves. Um, the f I, I, I'm really interested in computing um, you know, nearly singular things. And what, one very famous problem in fluid mechanics has to do with these um, highest amplitude traveling waves or standing waves. So this is a conjecture going back to Stokes in 1880. What I'm showing here is just a movie of, the almost, of an almost hi highest wave. Stokes had done a three or five term asymptotic expansion of a traveling water wave. And I'll show the equations in a minute, but I just thought I'd give you an overview. And you notice that the crests of the waves um, sharpen compared to the troughs. So he was imagining what would happen as you increase the amplitude of the wave. Um, eventually it will probably break down or something will, ha will go wrong. And he, he conjectured that there would actually at some point be a sharp singularity forming. So he conjectured this in 1880. He also was aware of this uh, um, self-similar wedge-shaped solution, which is a perfect wedge. The complex uh, velocity potential looks like that. It's a, just a power law. And so he imagined that somehow this would locally look like that solution. So you, and, and that's how he predicted the 120 degrees. It took 100 years, but eventually it was proved that, the, um, that there is a largest amplitude wave, and it does have a sharp corner, and it, it um, is 120 degrees. And that was done by Amick, Frankel, and Toland in 1982. Can I ask a couple of Sure. Yeah, periodic boundary conditions this way. It's actually infinite depth here. Um, so you'll see occasionally the particles come in and out. I think the particles, the particles are put there afterwards just to visualize the flow. I just started with a random distribution of particles so your eye could sort of follow what the flow is doing. And what do you mean by maximum amplitude? Right, so, um, so like th this wave would also travel. This is a taken out of Stokes' paper. Um, it's lower amplitude than this one. because. Um, Basically, what you're doing is, is measuring the, the height, which is the crest to trough um, distance there, the vertical. This is a steady state? Or this, is, this is traveling, but it, can be, it, it basically becomes steady state when you go into a wa uh, frame traveling right. with the wave. Yeah, that's right. So what I'll show you next is not steady state. Corner, right. right. Yeah. Yeah, so it starts off and smooth. And it, form, and it, forms it. it doesn't form it. It forms it as you increase the amplitude. So it's a per, it's a one parameter family of solutions, oh, and okay. at the end of the param, uh, of the parameterization that's is this corner wave. Point. That's the end point, exactly. Okay. For the dynamic problem, though, this is the one conjectured by. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that later. But for the dynamic problem, this is conjectured by Penny and Price. They had a similar idea. Their conjecture is that a standing wave would form a ninety degree angle, and this one would actually form the corner. Um, periodically. So it would form it just for that instant when it reaches the maximum amplitude right there. And then it would become smooth again and go back to this side and, and form the corner here. So this was conjectured in 53, also doing asymptotic expansions. They were just guessing sort of like Stokes did that this one parameter family of standing waves that's not singular would also terminate in a singular wave. And that singular wave would have corners. So that was their conjecture. Um, and th they picked 90 degrees, but their reasoning wasn't as clear as Stokes' reasoning. And um, there's this. So G.I. Taylor, one year later, uh, 1953 compared to 52, actually built this apparatus to try to generate the um, singular uh, um, standing wave. And he, this is a picture from, from his experiment. So he actually found that it does seem to make 90 degree angles. But there's this quote in his paper that says, uh, referring to the 90 degree angles, while this is undoubtedly true, I've been unable to follow their, their arguments. So it's been a somewhat, uh, um, it's been an open question for about 60 years whether these standing waves really do form corners or, or what's going on. That, that's, it's asymptotic, so it's not rigorous. It's basically, it's basically uh, they take the Stokes equations, they plug in a first order expansion and then they f plug that back in and get a second order the term. Other they rigorous, the Amick and Tolan and Frankel's rigorous, yeah. They use a boundary integral method, I think a Nekrasov equation to, to solve it. Good, okay, so there's this, so th this is, a, this is the sort of the question I set out to, to answer numerically, is to develop a method that's sort of capable of, of tracking um, nearly singular flows with a lot more accuracy than has been done before and, and try to answer this question definitively. And I learned a lot of interesting things about the water wave uh, along the way. Um, so one, one question that I'll get to a little bit later has to do with stability. Um, so, you know, it, it, it turns out that those almost singular Stokes wa or um, tra standing waves are not stable. If you perturb them a little bit, they start to uh, 
evolve exponentially away from them. But, but the lower amplitudes one, ones are stable, and so are these sorts of things. You can, this is now a finite depth standing wave, and the depth is so small that instead of looking like a big sloshing wave, it just looks like two counter-propagating uh, sort of solitary waves that crash into each other repeatedly. And it turns out some of these guys are stable too. Um, even these things that, I mean, this is the fluid depth, and when they interact, the, the wave actually goes up to almost the fluid depth. Here it goes up higher than the fluid depth. So I think it's interesting that standing waves sort of become these, uh, these things in, in, in shallower water. And so I want to talk about stability and long time dynamics when you start perturbing these things in the cases where they are stable. So that's roughly what I'm going to talk about. Um, there's another kind of wave where I can actually say something about quasi-periodicity. Quasi Basically connecting pure standing waves and pure traveling waves, there are a lot of waves in between. Basically they look like, like standing waves, but each time they come back to a, f to a spatial phase shift of wa where they start. So this sort of fits into the framework of looking at traveling waves and standing waves and looking at this whole uh, family of solutions. And these things, except in certain cases, are all quasi-periodic because you wouldn't really expect the, phase shift, the spatial phase shift to line up with the uh, wavelength of, of the domain. So they keep moving, jumping along the domain, possibly with a rational um, step each, each period. Um, What's that? Yeah, st uh, they're usually linearly stable. So you, you don't have a nonlinear, um, I don't have a Lyapunov function or something to, to bound it nonlinearly, but I can at least evolve it nonlinearly near a stable solution and see what happens. Oh, the, the use Plotnikov Tolan paper, I'll t I, mean, I will talk about that later. Yeah, I haven't gotten there yet. Um, but, but yeah, so there, there are some interesting questions about small divisors and things. So okay, so this is the outline of the talk. First I want to talk about numerical methods. I am an applied mathematician, so I do a lot of comp computing. I will talk about some theoretical work having to do with what John just mentioned about um, uh, Nash-Moser theory to um, prove existence of these solutions. But first I need to explain what the equations are, how I time step them, how I compute time periodic solutions, and then we'll get into some of the physics um, of what I've learned um, later in the talk. And please do stop me as we go. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, could you just see if there was a solution you could handle or you didn't? What, what is the statement? The statement is there exists a, he doesn't know about uniqueness, but there exists a solution with a, with a 120 degree corner. So there is a solution. There is a solution, that's right. That, that's, but that's all, that's all. That's right, that's right. And then there's another, which I, the slide that I skipped is actually what happens as you approach that solution. Yeah. Um, so this was so done. Yeah, but you're still in the not sharp case in the traveling waves. This was done by um, Longit, Higgins, and Fox in the 70s. What they did is an asymptotic expansion. Um, as the crest sharpens, what actually happens to the, to, the, uh, to the crest? And so instead of holding the wavelength fixed and letting the crest sharpen to, to a corner, what they, they did is hold the curvature of the, of the crest fixed and let the wavelength go to infinity. And then they ask what happens to that curve as you go. So what I've done here in this picture is show several different wavelengths where I multiplied by two each time and just show you how these things are basically collapsing onto this inner expansion of uh, uh, Longwood, Higgins, and Fox. And so they actually computed what this thing looks like numerically. And they found that it actually crosses the asymptote, the 120 degree asymptote, infinitely often. So there's this really interesting oscillatory approach to that corner wave, which uh, I don't think anybody expected until they had, they had done this work. That's right, yeah, if you, if, you try to, if you try to go further, the problem is for, for traveling waves, it's hard to really inc change the amplitude. I mean, I guess it sort of decays, but um, yeah, I, I think it, Vandenbroek has done some things where he's even found like crazy things, like a little circle of fluid on top of a wave. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, those things would be terribly unstable. Okay, great. Okay, so the equations, um, I'm assuming that we're dealing with potential flow, so that's a simplification. It's not Navier-Stokes, it's just Euler. And not only Euler, it's irrotational. So U is the gradient of a velocity potential phi. What we track is the interface height, eta of xt. And then you have a velocity potential in the fluid, which is phi, but you take its restriction, so I use a different letter. 
these var phi instead of regular phi, to represent what happens when you evaluate this on the moving surface. And what you want to do is find equations that evolve eta and evolve the restriction of phi to the surface and not actually have to worry about what's happening inside the fluid. So, right, eta is the fluid height. Okay. So um, in my pictures, as a function of t, you have, uh, actually th this is probably a good one. So as a function of t, you, what you're measuring is, like let's say this is x, eta of xt is just going up and down here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, phi is the velocity potential restric restricted to the surface. Uh -huh. And the, velocity the gradient of the velocity potential gives you how these particles are moving. So the particles are there just to visualize. They move according to um, x dot equals u of x, where u is the gradient of phi here. Okay. It, it's, it's essentially a one-dimensional problem, except that inside of the equations of motion, you have to solve for the, Lapl the Laplace equation off of the curve. So it's a really, I think, a really cool PDE. Um, once you make it one-dimensional, it's not really a PDE, because you've ma done this non-local thing of solving Laplace's equation. As a PDE, it's two-dimensional. Um, but once we're, once we're done with this stuff, it becomes one-dimensional but non-local. That's basically what happens. Okay, so the, the, way the, the way the equation works, there are basically two parts, one that says how eta evolves, one that says how, how var phi evolves. The eta equation is basically just saying that the, a particle that's on the surface stays on the surface. So if x of t and y of t is some particle that's on the surface, and you just differentiate it with respect to time, you find out that v, which is phi y, is equal to eta x u, which is phi x, plus eta t. So that gives you this equation here. The other equation is the fluid mechanics. This is where Euler's equations come into play. And you can write Euler's equations as the gradient of, of this thing. So this form of it's called Bernou one, of, one of the Bernoulli equations. It basically says that phi t plus 1 half um, grad phi squared plus p over rho plus gy is equal to a constant independent of space. You're allowed to let it depend on time if you want to. So c of t is only a function of time. Um, so that's what this equation is saying. And if you do take the gradient, you actually get Euler's equation. So that's the way I think about it, at least. Um, and then there's a problem that this, this phi t in Bernoulli's equation is the one where, t where space is fixed, but the wave is moving. So you just do a little chain rule to convert from the, the Eulerian frame to this sort of moving frame where you're st moving along the interface. T uh, t oh, right, t surface tension, which throughout the talk, in my previous talks, I, I mean, I, I have talks in which tau is important, but in this case, it's just zero in my talk today. That's for surface tension, which is basically a restoring force based on curvature. All right, so those are the equations of motion. Um, what makes them difficult is um, they're basically one dimensional except for solving this uh, um, incompressibility condition. And so I, th I guess, um, I mean, Zakharov was aware of this, but Craig and Sulem were the first to really formalize the elimination of all this stuff and just calling that a Dirichlet Neumann operator. So what you need in here, what you need in the equations of motion are derivatives of phi on the interface into the fluid. Um, if you knew the normal derivative, you could just take the, the plane tangential derivative along the curve to figure out what phi x and phi y are. So the main thing you need to know is d phi dn, that's what this is. So um, the hard part is computing d phi dn Given the restriction of phi to the boundary, figure out what d phi dn is um, on the boundary again. So you just lump that into an operator called g, and that's the standard notation for Dirichlet Neumann operators, and it's just defined to be phi y minus eta x phi x, which actually happens to be what the right-hand side of the eta equation is. So we can eliminate these guys by introducing this non-local operator g. To compute g, that's the hard part of the problem. I there are, there are many approaches. The one that I use in 2D is probably the best approach, is to do this um, uh, double layer potential method. So I re would represent phi in the fluid anywhere as a um, double layer. Basically, you have this unknown density mu. Um, the Newtonian potential in 2D looks like log of z minus zeta. And so dn dn zeta is, what you're doing is doing a superposition of these nice solutions of the Laplace equation in such a way that um, you can solve for mu as a second kind Fredholm integral equation. That's basically what, what it boils down to. So what I'm doing is, I don't know what mu is yet. This has to be solved for, but given any mu, I can, I can compute phi at any field point through this formula. And, and this, each of these guys satisfies the Laplace equation. Um, I'm writing it in terms of uh, complex, uh, let's see, 
you know what, there needs to be an i here. That's going to be confusing. Zeta is xi plus i eta um, xi of alpha. I've basically complexified in order to do this sum over periodic images. So what happens is you can write this dn dn zeta. Since, since I'm on a periodic domain, I have to figure out what is the contribution from each term um, that's outside of the domain when you, when you um, use periodicity. But in, in the 2D case, you can actually do that sum. And instead of 1 over z minus zeta, you end up with 1 half cotangent z over z minus zeta over 2. So this thing replaces the 1 over z um, in the dn dn zeta. So what that means is that I, given, given mu, I do this integral involving cotangents instead of in, in involving uh, this log of z minus zeta, and you end up with phi in the fluid somewhere. Yeah. Think of this as just 1 over 2 pi log r. OK. Good question. OK, so that's the next slide. So the, um, the idea is this is known at the free surface. So xi of alpha, let xi of alpha be alpha in our case. I shouldn't have, um, although I do this in the code, there's probably no reason to do it in the explanation. So zeta of alpha is just alpha plus eta of alpha. So it's just, um, in, or plus i eta of alpha. So it's, you move over alpha and you go up um, eta. Um, so given phi on the boundary, uh, as, you, as you let this formula, as you let z go to the boundary, you end up with this uh, delta function happening. Um, that's a standard thing that happens in potential theory. Um, I think in this formulation, it looks like a Cauchy integral, and so it's like Plum Plumelli's formula. But if you approach from the bottom, you get a plus sign. If you approach from the top, you get a minus sign here. So this is a formula that has to be solved for mu given phi. Basically, what you're doing is just letting the field point z approach the boundary and seeing what happens with that, with that singular integral. And k, um, this is just, you know, this, this is what you get when you sum over periodic images. This guy here is used to regularize this. This thing is singular um, because you have a cotangent becomes, uh, is like 1 over z when z goes to 0. So if you subtract this guy off, um, you're taking the imaginary part, so you're not actually doing anything to the result. But the difference here is actually regular. So k ends up being a continuous function in spite of appearances, in spite of the singularity here, because you took the imaginary part. So you have a nice continuous function integrated against mu plus 1 half the identity applied to mu is equal to phi. So that is a second kind Fred Holm integral equation. This thing is compact. Um, so once you've solved for mu, then you can compute g phi by taking a derivative of this thing as you approach the boundary. And the details are a little complicated, but in fact, the formulas are almost the same. Beta becomes alpha, the imaginary part becomes real part, and uh, this part's the same. And so um, one thing that happens is instead of the, mu the one half, you end up with a Hilbert transform. And uh, we are taking a derivative. And the way that shows up is just taking a derivative of mu inside of the integrand. So that's the procedure. Given phi, solve for mu, differentiate mu, plug it into the Hilbert transform, integrate against a slightly different kernel, and you get g. All right, so that's, the, that's a way to um, compute Dirichlet Neumann operators. To do it numerically, you just discretize everything. Um, since everybody's smooth, um, the trapezoidal rule converges exponentially fast. So you can form these matrices. Um, integration just becomes matrix vector multiply. This thing turns into a matrix equation. And you don't need that many, um, uh, you don't need to discretize with that many points to reach machine precision because things do converge exponentially fast. So that's, the, that's basically the plan or the, the way it works. Um, this is, well, OK. So there's another formulation which I needed to write down if I'm going to talk about the, the expansions that John was asking about, which is the conformal mapping formulation. So this is a, just a different way of, of dealing with the Laplace equation. What you do is you complexify your parameter alpha, which I use to parameterize the curve, to the lower half plane. So you introduce a beta. And then x plus i y is the, ma or z equals x plus i y is the mapping from the from the half plane to the physical domain, which has a curved surface. I'm still going to let zeta be the curve, just to try to make it familiar with what we just did. I will also complexify the velocity potential by adding a stream function to it. So, um, so basically, the kinematic condition um, with a particle staying on the surface just turns into, uh, just turns into this equation, um, xi alpha, xi being the x component of this, 
eta t minus eta alpha xi t equals minus psi alpha. Um, so I'm trying to think what's the easiest way to see that this stuff works. Um, the d phi dn, um, that's the, so I think this is a very physical equation. It's saying that the normal velocity of the curve is equal to the, um, th this is the gradient of the velocity potential, so it's basically the, the, the normal velocity of the fluid. Normal velocity of the curve is equal to the normal velocity of the fluid, and then because this thing is conformal, phi plus i psi is conformal, d phi dn is equal to d psi d alpha. In other words, it's, it's like this. So that's what's happening here, um, and this thing is just kinematically what does zeta t dot n mean. Um, another, and then if you just plug in, plug these things in here, this is how, this is another way to write exactly the same thing. The fluid mechanics in the conformal variables, um, again, you're basically looking for Bernoulli's equation. So this is Bernoulli, phi t equals this guy. But to figure out what phi t is, you have to be a little bit careful again about the fact that this phi is sort of with z, z fixed, whereas when you pull it back, uh, freezing alpha and freezing zeta are not the same thing. So that's all I'm doing with calling this side f and this side phi. This is like our var phi and this is like the, the, the regular phi. Um, so when you do the chain rule, all I'm tr that's all I'm trying to get at here. When you do the chain rule, you pick up a term here um, from the change of variables and then you have this guy which is related to Bernoulli. So real ft minus this capital phi prime zeta t, that's the chain rule to, un to, to freeze the point in space on the right is equal to Bernoulli. And once you've done that, then it basically is just a matter of um, unraveling what everything means and you'll end up with this equation, which every time I see that it looks incomprehensible, but it really is just Bernoulli's equation written uh, wh where, where you just take all, all your pieces and throw it into the corresponding places. Um, so these, are these two equations are what the people like Yus and Plotnikov use when they are trying to um, do asymptotic expansions, basically, is you build your theory. Satisf satisfying these two equations are, um, is equivalent to um, solving the order equations. The way I have used this in the past is something, is a, a method due to um, Zakharov and Diachenko. Basically, I mean, as it is, this is just, um, these are just two equations that have to be satisfied to satisfy Euler Euler's equation, but they're, they don't tell you how to march the solution. So what Zakharov and Diachenko did is they figured out that um, you, what you want is a formula for a to t, so they complement this guy with, um, with another equation that um, basically what they do is realize that this is the real component of uh, zt over, zeta al of, over z alpha at the boundary. And the imaginary component <laughs> turns out to be this, oh, sorry, this is the imaginary component, this is the real component, and, and they're gonna be related by a Hilbert transform since the Hilbert transform maps are the real part of a um, analytic function to the imaginary part. So that was, I think, their main idea, is that you can figure out how to link this condition to the, the rest of it you need to solve for a to t by a Hilbert transform. Once you've done that, um, and also this equation actually becomes this equation through a similar thing, zeta t over zeta alpha is actually this thing restricted to the boundary. So that's where that Hilbert transform comes from. So anyway, th their time-stepping method is solve these two equations for a to t and then evolve phi according to what that translates to when you um, actually carry out the real part. All right, so anyway, um, complicated stuff, but it's really um, just a different way of solving the Laplace equation um, using a conformal map. And one nice thing is you're just dealing with Hilbert transforms instead of um, do it solving those boundary integrals. So that's why it's a fast method. Okay, so in terms of computing time periodic solutions, um, so I, I've done this for a lot of different problems. For the particular, for, for in this talk, um, I think the key features of my methods, they're spectrally accurate in space. Um, eighth and 15th, those are pretty arbitrary, but I, th that's just how I coded them up. In double precision calculations, I do an eighth order time stepping method. In quadruple precision, I do a 15th order time stepping method. They're fast because of parallel computation. Um, that's one place where I benefit from having a connection with Lawrence Berkeley Lab is they have big, big machines so I can, I can use them. And then one thing I've been working to um, develop our robust shooting methods, and I add robustness by making the problem overdetermined, um, and, and sort of zero padding in the initial condition with additional Fourier modes to make sure that you've resolved all of your modes. Um, okay, so that's the, those are some of the features. Um, the first problem I did of this type um, was actually for the Benjamin Ono equation, which is a, uh, 
integrable model of certain internal waves in, um, in basically in stratified fluids. Um, so I have a paper with Dave Ambrose. I have a couple papers with Dave, Dave Ambrose on this. Um, we also studied the vortex sheet with surface tension, um, which is basically two fluids instead of just one like I'm talking about today. And then Nathan Coots and his students were um, looking for help with this mode lock laser system and we managed to make this, this method um, study uh, transition or dynamics of, of their mode locked lasers. How kind of phenomena did you see with this vortex sheet? Uh, was this a small uh, perturbation that you see? Or was we were looking at pretty large ones. Um, I have a slide somewhere, I'm sure. Okay, if I remember, I can show you at the end of the talk. Yeah. Um, the, the small ones, Dave, Dave Ambrose had, had seen in his numerical simulations that if he evolved them, they came back nearly to where they started. And so we thought, let's try actually exact getting them to come back exactly to where they started. Um, and that's sort of what's, what really um, got me interested in time periodic solutions was trying to tackle that problem. Um, eventually, we got things that overturned and still managed to come back. So instead of rolling up like they often do, um, even even with even with the with the shear flow at the top, they can they can overturn and then come back. So that's what the movie will be when I show it to you later. Okay, so uh, so then this uh, the standing waves um, are things that I was doing pretty much on my own. I I, I did have one student help me with the uh, with uh, some of the computations in um, uh, parts of this work, and then um, actually we 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 now have a three D water wave code, I'm not sure I listed that anywhere. Um, and um, another of my students is looking at, at rolling tires. So basically you take a tire and you roll it at a very fast speed. It will start to either oscillate or go into various sort of um, polygonal shapes. So here's a picture of a drag racer um, racing down the road and the, sh the, the tire actually has five sides now. <laughs> and so um, we've been looking at the dynamics of that problem whether or not you're in contact with a road and what are sort of the stable configurations of a rapidly spinning um, material. And so all of these methods are turning out to be useful for, the, for this nonlinear elastici elasticity problem. Um, okay, so in terms of um, actually computing uh, a time periodic solution, basically I've shown you how to time step or I've at least shown you what the equations of motion look like. Um, so what you have to do is figure out how to rig the or choose the initial conditions so that at the later time it will come back to where, where you started. So um, for, the, for the symmetric standing wave like this one, the easiest way to do this is declare t equals zero to be when it's as close to flat as possible. So right, right at this moment here. Um, and then what you try to do is get the wave to actually come to a complete stop at a later time. So if you can get the velocity potential to be zero at time t over four, you can then use a symmetry argument to say that it'll come back the way it, it went and if you have the right kinds of symmetries in your initial condition as well, then it will carry on with a phase shift and the, and the peak will come up on the other side. So it's like you're, you only ha actually have to evolve over a quarter of the pendulum. Um, so that's what, that's what this buys you. So what I need to do is drive phi to zero at time t over so you're four. You're looking for periodic, time periodic solutions? Yes, right? yeah, that's right. And, and you're not finding any conditions that are conducive. Exactly, right. And so, so, right, so what I'm doing is I just, for any initial condition, and C is my, my name for initial conditions, the Fourier modes of the initial condition. For any initial condition, I can evolve the water wave to some, also I'm guessing the period, so over, over some time t over four, compute this number, and it'll be some number, probably not zero. And then you, basically you try to adjust the initial conditions to drive this thing to zero, that's the plan. I am also searching for the period. So, so varying the period will, will also change f. So basically the idea is f is something we would like to be zero. Um, if you can get it to be zero, then you have a periodic solution. So, and I'll, I'll explain how I drive it to zero in a second, but supposing I have an algorithm for minimizing f and it keeps returning zero, what I do is choose one of the Fourier modes, say C1, impose, it, impose its value minimize over all the other degrees of freedom, all the other Cs, until F goes to zero, and then I adjust the, the, the parameter that I'm varying again and do the same thing. So th in that way, you basically continue along this, this one parameter family of solutions. And th these are just different slices through the solution, different ways of, of visualizing it. What I'm looking at are Fourier modes of the initial condition. Um, and so in this range, you're basically pretty well approximated by linear theory, so you can predict 
quite well what the initial conditions look like here to have a periodic solution. Once you get down to here, um, there's actually turning points and crazy things are happening. At that point, you're well beyond linear theory and you really have to be doing computations. Okay, so as we move along the curve, the, the peak sharpens. I think these, these things don't show very well on the projector, but here it's getting pretty sharp. Um, the traditional way to, to plot these things are, is to show crest acceleration here and wave height here. Wave height is half the crest to trough distance. Um, crest acceleration is at the moment the wave comes to rest, what is the acceleration of a particle at the crest sort of as it free falls? So those are the two parameters. It, Penny and Price had in mind that this was the parameter that would lead to a singularity. You increase this, eventually you'll run into trouble. Um, Mercer and Roberts found you increase this and eventually it, there's a turning point and it starts to decrease. So they thought, okay, well, surely crest acceleration as you approach the acceleration of gravity is, is where you're going to have this, this, this singularity. So that's why people switch to, to this. So are you investigating with, uh, with uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and pr I probably show that in like three slides, two or three slides. Yes. Okay, so um, to actually do the minimization, basically what I'm doing, it's like a Newton method, but it's, um, it's basically Newton's method where, y where you constrain the size of your steps. So basically you approximate your function f with some quadratic approximation based on the current uh, value and uh, Jacobian matrix and, and possibly Hessian. Um, in, in the levenberg marquardt approach, you actually drop the hard part of the Hessian where you have to, so first of all, we're doing nonlinear least squared, so it looks like R transpose R that you're minimizing. So when you, when you compute the Hessian, there's the nice piece, which is J transpose J, J being grad R, and then there's the not nice piece, which is R, sum of Ri times the Hessians of the, of the Ri's. You just neglect this, and the idea is that as Ri goes to zero, these terms go to zero anyway. So you still end up getting quadratic convergence. Um, and the other thing that Levenberg and Marquardt do is put this constraint. It's uh, basically the largest step size where you trust the quadratic model and you minimize this over this region. And then based on how well that did, how well the, the prediction did to what the next F actually was, you either increase or decrease the size of the, of the trust region. To, to actually solve this thing is just a little bit of linear algebra. It turns out not to be too hard. Um, there's one Lagrange multiplier here that has to be solved for. All right. Um, very ugly Jacobian, but it's doable. It, it, involves, uh, it involves lots of solutions of the Laplace equation, but it's all the same. It's all linearized around the same nonlinear solution. So, um, so in fact, it's the same data structure for all the uh, different columns of the Jacobian. Um, it's the same Dirichlet Neumann map, which is. It's the, yeah. Uh, what is this the Jacobian of? This is the Jacobian of. Um, so remember I had f was equal to, there's too many, yeah. f is 1 half r transpose r, which is actually an integral of phi. So what r is are the values of phi times some quadrature weights. So you're trying to drive phi to zero. So you're evaluating phi at the various alpha sub i's. Sum the squares of them, that gives you f. So, the, so r is the values of phi at the grid, on the grid. j are the derivatives of r with respect to initial conditions. So for each Fourier mode of the initial condition, the corresponding column of J says, how much does R change as I vary that initial Fourier mode? So it's a, it's a big matrix where the columns correspond to Fourier modes of the initial condition, and the rows correspond to the values of the velocity potential <laughs> at the grid points at the later time. And um, what you're doing here is you're solving the linearized water wave equations, um, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, in, in practice, you really only have to compute the Jacobian once, and then you use it a few times, and, and you can still converge to machine precision, as long as you're doing numerical continuation and not taking too big a steps. So I basically compute the Jacobian once, and then Newton's method sort of converges very quickly. Right. So that's the idea. Here's the results. So, um, so there had been a lot of I, um, you know, conjectures about what happens to this largest amplitude traveling wave. Um, the 90 degree. No, not yet. Oh, there is actually, and I'll show you. I'll show you. Um, so, uh, but but so in my work so far, there ha that hasn't come up because I'm not solving it in that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, so let's see. Um, Penny and Price thought there would be a 90 degree angle. Schwartz and Whitney thought it would be maybe cusp-like or at least uh, 
you know, sharper than 90. I think Mercer and Roberts found that it would be something like 60. I find that there is no limiting wave. In fact, there are lots of different families of solutions. Each of them starts to develop some non-self-similar structure near the crest tip. And um, so basically what's happening, as you're following this thing towards where the singularity was supposed to happen, the bifurcation curve actually fragments into a lot of different pieces. And each of those curves ends up not going, becoming singular, but ends up picking up various uh, patterns of, of waves on the, um, on the free surface. So if I compare to what I did earlier with the um, almost highest traveling wave, what, what they did there was rescale things so the curvature was constant and let the wavelength go to infinity. I'm doing the same here. I'm basically taking my solutions, rescaling the curvature to be one, and then plotting things. And you would expect it to go to one if it was going to form a um, 90 degree corner. It does that for a while, but eventually as the, as the solution starts to develop these oscillations, the, uh, it just completely loses its uh, self-similarity. These things are not collapsing onto a universal curve. So that just shows that the whole idea of, of um, this breakdown of you know, this, this formation of a corner as being the mechanism by which this family s stops is, is just wrong. It's, um, it's a lot more complicated because of the dynamics. But um, a anyway, it, I We see, uh, I'll, sh I'll show you that in a couple slides too. Yeah, good. Um, so yeah, this is just the comparison. So this, this guy does become singular. This is what happens in the traveling wave case. These things collapse onto this curve. Um, one over root three being 120 degrees. In, in, our, in our case, they start to seem like they're gonna collapse on 90 degrees, which is slope of one on each side. But then, um, in fact, you end up with fine scale structure. I don't, let's see. So accuracy check, I mean, whenever you start to see disconnections and things, you wonder if it's a numerical artifact. Um, so here's the most singular solution I computed. So th this is phi starting off at around 0.5 and evolving toward, <laughs> toward zero. And then it's a different scale at, at time t over four where it's basically round off error, 10 to the minus 12 here. I'd, I then repeated the whole calculation with the same initial conditions, but in quadruple precision. So so now you could conceivably get down to 10 to the minus, uh, like, uh, I don't know, tw 26-ish. Um, but since I have the wrong initial conditions, I'm not gonna get um, too far down there, except that now this thing is fully resolved. So basically I have enough grid points inside of the wiggles here to actually have this be the correct solution. So it's nice that you go from double precision to quadruple precision, and now you've fully resolved it, and, and the answer is basically the same as the double precision answer. So that gives you confidence. Um, this problem was too big to do the whole calculation in quadruple precision, but I did that for the uh, for a not, not quite as sharp wave. And there I can get f down to 10 to the minus 60. f is a square of an error, so that means the error is around 10 to the minus 30, just like you would expect if that's your round off threshold. So it really appears that the numerical method is succeeding in computing time periodic solutions, limited, constrained by whatever your round off is for the, for the method. So Anyway, I believe the results, all those different curves have, uh, have this much accuracy in them. Um, so now, that, now your question is, um, so basically your question is, if there's no extreme wave, where do the, where do the curves end? It must be something singular. Um, another question is, where do the, those disconnections come from? And then the third one, which sort of will be the second part of the talk, is are the solutions stable? So this is, I think, a nicer way to actually see all the different curves. The <coughs> wave height crest acceleration um, these curves sort of get smashed on top of each other. But if I plot the 60th Fourier mode of the initial condition versus crest acceleration, you really see how they all end up separating. So I'm gonna, and, um, okay, so this is the bifurcation diagram and corresponding to each of the endpoints is one of the, one of the curves over there. Okay, so I, I think we wanna know about this one, but first let me explain about physically what are the disconnections. Um, so um, there are a lot more disconnections in shallow water. Um, so here's sort of something where the depth is one instead of an infinite, uh, and it's solution C. So it's growing the because because there's a wall to push off of the so the wave can um, grow taller, and when you look at this bifurcation curve, there's actually a lot of disconnections in it. So what I want to do is just show you physically what is the difference between this solution and this solution on these two different sides, on these two different branches. What does that mean by disconnection? Oh, good question. Yeah. So the point is. Um, Disconnection, so the way my, sorry, I'm trying to go back to here. So what I found was that these guys, you know, I'm tracking a curve 
And then all of a sudden, I've jumped to another curve. Not on purpose, the numerical continuation algorithm just did it. When I solved for the new solution, I ended up on a different curve. So then I take smaller steps and figure out where did those curves go, and it turned out that they were just different curves that were nearby each other. So what I mean by disconnections is uh, literally just that there are two families of solutions where the bifurcation diagram has them passing close to each other, and in fact, the solutions are actually almost the same. They, they differ slightly when you resolve them well enough, but um, there are basically two different solutions that are quite close to each other here. So disconnections just means that the curves are sort of disconnected instead of forming a single smooth continuous uh, thing. So, um, so I want to show what this disconnection corresponds to physically. And the idea is that um, as I move along, let's see, what am I doing? C, D, E, F, I end up with these um, solutions with color coded. Um, so the C solution was very large. The F solution has lower amplitude. And it has these, this secondary standing wave on top of it. Whereas G ha also has a secondary standing wave, but it ends up going down at the crest instead of sharpening at the crest. So I think what has happened is that the, the main wave has somehow excited a resonance between this higher frequency wave and, the, and, um, and itself, the longer wave. And that, that higher frequency can come with a couple of different phases and still be time periodic. So in this case, it, it's sort of sharpening the crest, and in this case, it's pushing down the crest. And a movie of that really shows that it is standing waves on standing waves. All of those disconnections are due to this kind of phenomenon where basically there's another standing wave that's sitting on top of the main standing wave, and there are multiple phases that you can put the secondary standing wave on um, the main one. So that's why they're nearby, is the basic, the sort of large amplitude, large scale wave is, is roughly the same, but then there are a couple of different phases for the higher frequency wave. So that's physically what's happening. Okay, so these kinds of, every time you see a disconnection in the bifurcation diagram, usually there's a corresponding physical um, <laughs> oscillation happening at the surface. Corresponding. This is still fully periodic. Yeah, the quasi-periodic is coming soon. So as you change the fluid depth, these disconnections change, that, you know, it has quite a, quite a large effect. So, so this is what I just showed you. This was mean depth 1.0. If I increase the depth, this G and this F have actually meet, so you end up with this structure. As I continue to increase the depth, this guy breaks off and f forms a closed loop here, and this guy um, sort of nicely connects the, the zero amplitude solution to the solution C. And then as you keep going, this thing here disappears, and you just have a, a small little bump, and then by the time you get to 1.09, you hardly know there's any kind of resonance. So those resonances are very sensitive to the, to the depth. All right, and also as you increase the depth, the number of them de decreases. Here's the most careful, I, this was, um, I, I just noticed that these things were nucleating out of nowhere and I thought that was interesting. So I went to a lot of trouble to track all of these different branches as I changed the fluid depth. Um, so basically you can, have ti you can have time periodic solutions just appear out of nowhere. And then the family, as you change the depth, the, it turns into families of these things that then merge with the, main solution and eventually, once they merge, you'll see those disconnections there forever as you continue to decrease the, the depth. So I think this is a, a, a mechanism for those disconnections appearing in the bifurcation curves. As you decrease the depth, certain resonances occur and then end up being sort of stuck in or frozen into the curves. Um, harmonic resonance is another feature. or is it, Basically what this means is in the flat state, um, there are certain critical depths where standing waves of different um, wavelengths will, uh, will um, well, for example, <laughs> in this particular, at this particular depth, this cr um, critical depth, a wave with seven oscillations will, will oscillate um, three times in the time the main oscillation oscillates once. Just the frequency of the one turns out to be three times the frequency of the other. So for the same period, you can have two different solutions of the linearized problem. So what I'm doing here, so th this curve here and this curve and this curve here correspond to those pure mode. This is like a pure seven mode solution and this is a pure one mode solution. For some reason, there's this extra solution that comes in. It's a solution of the nonlinear equations that you wouldn't predict from linear theory. And th that kind of phenomenon is known as a Wilton's ripple. So you have this particular critical depth where these guys meet and then you pick up these extra curves of solutions. 
if you then perturb this, you end up with all kinds of, you, you end up with that splitting, and you end up with additional disconnections in the bifurcation curves. So it's another mechanism by which you'll find disconnections in curves at not critical depths that are somehow related to some nearby resonance. All right. Um, and I've done that in 3D as well. So this is work with Chris Rycroft where we uh, found a similar structure to what I just showed you in 2D where this time periodic solution and this sort of pure mode time periodic solution happened to have very similar periods. So we superimposed them together and then looked for, and then minimized the thing and, and, and found a sort of composite time periodic solution that sort of had features of both of these. So this guy is somewhere on this branch, whereas this one is this one, and this one is that one. So you have lots of non-uniqueness in, in these. Um, I don't know. I think it's, uh, it's, that's a really good question. I've been thinking about that for a long time. Um, I'll, show you, um, I'll show you what seems to be known theoretically. Oh, here. Okay. Um, I, I don't know this one, no. Okay, yeah. Right, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is, this is basically how they would do it, except they're solving ODEs, so, it, so it's a finite dimensional shooting method instead of... Right. No, yeah, you're right. I right. I saw, I've s I saw somebody had put together a web page of really cool three-body problem pe periodic solutions. In fact, that's sort of what I did with Benjamin Ono, too, is you can do pole dynamics on that and make, make the poles come back. Um, in terms of where do the curves end, it seems that what's happening is you're ending up with blow, blow up and higher self-aleph norms. Like the, the higher frequencies are just becoming more and more um, active and large. And, and at some point, I run out of resolution. I just can't, I can't continue on, but this is not looking smooth anymore. So I'm th I think that's probably what's hap what happens. Um, another thing is that um, the curves don't end at all. Sometimes they come back on themselves. Like this guy actually ended up coming back and meeting this curve. So that's another way you can avoid a, singul uh, a singularity at the end is if it comes back and gets reincorporated into the same fig picture. The craziest idea is this um, idea that you have Cantor-like structure, or that, that it's not smooth curves of solutions at all. It could be actually parametrized by a totally disconnected Cantor set. So in shallow water, that kind of looks like what's happening. Here's the first Fourier mode, looks fairly smooth. 17th Fourier mode, um, you're starting to see quite a few disconnections in the curves. 36th Fourier mode, same solutions here. Um, now they're really violently jumping all over the place. And each of those solutions, I mean, each, each dot here, there's a corresponding dot here and here. That solution is known to uh, 17 digits of accuracy. Um, but then the neighboring solution, which is also known to 17 digits of accuracy, somehow just jumped to another branch. So this, I think, is what you would see if you, if you really had something which was mathematically parametrized by a Cantor set, but then you're, you're sort of stuck to windows that are of size 10 to the minus 17. You'll just see these <laughs> this, this kind of behavior. Yeah, but this is just the small divisors. Small divisors, yeah, exactly. So, um, so here's, so this is what I did this week because I thought that you might be interested actually. So um, actually, so, so here I'm in the infinite depth case looking for problems. I'm looking for, for disconnections. Aside from these guys, and I think I found one here, and that was it. I did not find any other evidence of, of a disconnection on the curve here. And to find this one, I actually had to land in a window that was of size 10 to the minus 12. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So in the 10th digit of, of, of this parameter, um, you actually have to zoom in that far to see any kind of um, um, sort of disconnection or trouble. So, so I have been thinking that maybe the infinite depth case actually is smooth. Like somehow when you're, when you're down in this region, the, uh, the proof of use Plot Plotnikov and Toland uses this Nash-Moser theory and deals with those small divisors. Um, 
and, and they can only establish existence on a Cantor set. But I, I decided to look at their paper and implement their sort of constructive algorithm. So this is the, these are our conformal mapping formulation of the water wave equations. Um, you introduce this extra variable W, which is F zeta. So zeta now has become the conformal variable, which is annoying, but um, it's because this is coming out of a different paper than, than um, the usual notation I use. But what, what, what Schwartz and Whitney did in, in 1981 is they took this as a guess for the formu form of the standing water waves, plugged it into these equations, and solved yeah. term by term. Yeah, so what? A flat state, zero. Yeah, zero amplitude flat state. Yeah. Which is essentially That's absolutely right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so anyway, so I wanted to see, you know, with, with my knowledge of doing high, high precision numerics and, uh, you know, access to big machines, I thought I could, and also 30 years have passed since the previous calculation of this approach. I wanted to know what happens to these coefficients as you, as you go. Um, so this is, this is from Amick and Tolan's paper, which was in 87, which is basically a proof that the Schwartz and Whitney algorithm um, at least gives a formally um, correct solution of the Euler equations. But it doesn't, it's not clear that the coefficients don't grow too fast. And in fact, I think in the 2005 paper, they think that the coefficients probably grow super exponentially, and therefore the radius of convergence goes to zero. So basically there's this, complicated algebraic system of equations, which are for the coefficients in this expansion that Schwartz and Whitney proposed. So these coefficients are what you're solving for. Um, you write these things down on a lattice. It's a real mess because every time you you're at a square, like nine or four or um, 16 or 25, every time you're at a square, there's a resonance problem where that particular mode does is, is um, time periodic and is not determined uniquely. So you have to go to the next two orders to figure out what it is, but Anyway, it can be done. So you, you, can, you can find a way to uniquely determine all the coefficients in, the, in this infinite lattice. Um, and Schwartz and Whitney managed to get to 25th order, which is here, um, here, I guess. Um, and then, so this is what I, I computed this past week. So, th so this, this is the coefficients A, the norms of the A's, as you go to up to 500th order. And the red curve are the coefficients of the, um, of the period. Basically, you have to expand the period as well. And I saw this happen, and I was worried about it, but it seems to actually be a round-off error thing. So if I use 180, 108 digits of, of in the calculations, then I get these curves. And if I use 360 digits, I get these curves. Um, but the point is that this thing is only growing exponentially. Like if I look at, if I do the ratio test, it's going up to about 3.3. And if I do one over this, I flip it around, this thing is going to here. It's not going to zero. Um, so I think that the. But it wasn't super exponential after all. It wasn't super after all. And I, I think, especially seeing that these guys even, I mean, the round off error grows. Yeah, the round off error, that's like way early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I, I'm hoping. I mean, I, this, was, this was already the maximum. I used 32 computers at LBL for 24 hours. I felt like I probably shouldn't run it again. <laughs> um, so anyway, the, the fact that even the round-off errors are only growing exponentially makes me think that it may be possible to prove this, uh, prove that the Nash-Moser was not necessary for the infinite depth case. Um, all right, so I've, I've probably used up a lot of my time. I'll try to summarize what the rest of the talk is. Uh, so with stability, what I've done is looked at Floquet multipliers of linearize around these solutions and look at the Floquet multipliers. If the Floquet multiplier is equal to one, then it's linearly stable. If it deviates from one, as happens up here when you're at the extreme waves, then it's unstable. So these guys up here are unstable. Mercer and Roberts did something similar. They found this curve and they found this curve. Um, this guy is new, these guys are new. So there are all these weird little pockets of instability <laughs> that seem to be scattered around through the, through the family of water waves. So one thing I've done is seed so in, in this unstable region, seed the initial condition with the unstable direction and see what happens. And I seem to be getting quasi-periodic dynamics off of the perturbing off of, off of the wave. So what, what I'm showing here is over 10,000 periods of the unperturbed wave, what happens to the perturbed wave? And I'm only showing at snapshots of what would be the flat state. 
So basically you're seeing like this sort of breathing thing that happens over, I think about five or 6,000 periods where the solution does that, but basically stays near the um, solution. So I'm guessing that this, this thing is going from purely periodic to some sort of quasi-periodic thing, but it's still basically a, a Good question, okay. So what, I, what I've done is I picked an unstable mode uh, sorry, I picked an, uns an unstable parameter where, where there are these flow k multipliers outside of the unit circle. I started with my pure standing wave, which would be here. Or, sorry, I guess the, la la the pure standing wave has these unstable modes. So I just add 10 to the minus 6 times the unstable mode and then evolve nonlinearly over 10,000 cycles and just ask what happens. And it seems to basically cycle through this additional breathing phase that has its own period, but doesn't seem to really take you too far away from the original standing wave. And then, um, so I, yeah, I should stop. I should skip that part. Hold on. So I look at flow k multipliers of this too. Um, I found that this top guy was stable to harmonic perturbations. And so then my question was, if I take two traveling waves and collide them into each other, um, that these traveling waves have the same energy as that um, time periodic solution. I collide these things over, I think this was 5,000 cycles, and ask what happens. And it seems like this also basically stays near the nearby time periodic solution and, and simply has a bunch of other oscillations that are going around it. So I think this is sort of quasi-periodic behavior too. Here I actually plotted every 10th, the position of the, of the wave after every 10 um, cycles. And it basically still looks like two waves going in and out. So I think all of those. Stokes collision, Stokes waves are traveling waves. So a Stokes collision is take two that, yeah, and right. That's right. And so, um, so here I did an FFT of the data I got. You have a strong mode here, and then you have all these other things, which I think could be quasi-periods of the, of the solution, basically. All right, and then I was going to say some things about traveling standing waves, just that they exist and um, are sort of a pretty well-defined way of, of getting quasi-periodic behavior if the torus is only two-dimensional. Um, oh, and, and, and this was sort of a connection to what I did with Benjamin Ono. In the Benjamin Ono equation, which I, maybe I didn't write it down, it's ut plus uux uh, plus huxx equals zero. Um, the, in the Benjamin Ono equation, we found bifurcations from stationary solutions to traveling waves, and I parameterized, all, I figured out what all of them were how to, how to look at a particular perturbation and figure out where it was going to go to with this path of nonlinear solutions. So the Euler equation seemed to have similar things, um, ex and that's for Benjamin Ono. The Euler equations have similar structures where you perturb and you follow it over and you end up at a traveling wave from a standing wave, but you have all these other disconnections and resonances, I think, again, due to all these small divisors that are there. So I, but, but I think it, it's interesting that in certain regimes, the, the, the water wave equations um, resemble things that happen in our model equations like KDV and NLS and Benjamin Ono, um, but they're just a little bit messier because of, because of these resonances. So let me just well get that. Helps. That's true, yeah. I haven't either, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's hard to do. Right. And all. I, I haven't either. I mean, I think that if you read Use Plotnikov and Tolan's paper, they basically say, we tried to use standard Nash Moser theory. It's too complicated. So we developed our own that's specific to the 2D Euler. So all of this stuff is open in 3D, too, because they, they have to rely on conformal mapping for the, for the, uh, the proofs. And it's, if I understand the, um, their paper, which is 110 pages long, but it's actually quite well written, it's, it's, it's possible to, to, to uh, understand it, but I, I haven't. So that paper proves what? That paper proves that there exist solutions for very small amplitude. Right. It's physical. Yes. Standard right. Yeah. That's right. But is, my is it just quasi-periodic or periodic? Just periodic. Just, just periodic. periodic. Yeah. That's right. So there's, yeah, I think wh what I can do numerically, there's a l I, c I see a lot more behavior than what they can prove, but that's expected. <laughs> <laughs>
Right. <laughs> All right, thank you, that's it.